it's it's none of my business what anyone thinks of my work. All I can do is I do me and be as fully expressed as I can and have the best time I can while I'm doing it. And and that's kind of it because I have I although yeah, we're talking about skin in the game, but I fundamentally have no ownership over what I've done once I've done it. Do this thing. Got it. Do you have to accept that or some nonsense? Yeah, I no, I press got it. You press got I it. I got it. I got you it. You press there's a got it just for you. Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah. This is all going in the show, by the way. So okay. this is how I'm starting. Okay. But for people who don't know who you are. This is Lucy Russell, an amazing human being, actress. And, and I got it. I got and it. She's got it. And she's got it because she's recently just off the back of her latest show winning an Emmy, Atlantic Crossing, best miniseries. How cool is that? Last time I saw you, I think it was October, and you kind yeah. of quietly whispered to me and said, I think it was before it was announced, but it was something I think I might be up for, or we might be like winning an Emmy or something like that. But it was well, still nominated for, I think. Or nominated. Yeah. So yeah. it was still, it was on the horizon two months. No, no, no. I don't think, I know. I think I must have known because we, I don't think we had an, any idea that, that, that we were actually, you know, going to be nominated. Right. So um, you, you must have known intuitively then, because if, if you didn't know, <laughs> So, you know, I can't remember anything from last week. Yeah, I was going to say October feels like a long time ago, but it's not. But yeah, long... no, I must have known about the nomination. I was probably just kind of uh, uh, um, uh, trying to just kind of take in the fact that because we were all super excited that we were nominated. I mean, it just was so out of it felt completely out of left field. I mean, obviously, the producers must have uh, uh, put it in. Because, sure. but I mean, that's, they're asking for entries now up until February. So I guess, yeah, I mean, that would have gone in in January or something. So, I mean, that's a complete punt in the dark. Um, but I guess between October and now, which is two months, which ain't yeah. much, a lot's happened. Because from knowing you're nominated or probably nominated to then winning and then everything else in your life, yeah. you see where I'm going with this, like, What's the last few months been like for you with all of that bubbling on? <sighs> well, it's weird because, I mean, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, I mean, it was super exciting when we found out we were nominated, but it's also not really knowing, there's a part of it which is not really knowing what that means in the sense that, um, and I'm not in any way dissing any kind of Emmy, okay, but... It's like there's there's the Emmys, Emmys, sure. and then there's you know all the, the 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 big ones, and but this is international Emmys, and I'm like, don't know anything about it really, and it's just like the fact it's an Emmy sounds really exciting, sure. uh, but, and so it was swinging out of being really excited, and then, it's actually that sort of thing of, oh, am I being a twat for being really excited? Maybe it's just like not actually that cool at all. And maybe it's like the international Emmys are like the, 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 the slightly sad little cousin who everyone invites along to family get togethers, but is always a bit awkward and doesn't talk to anyone. But they still love him. They still love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're still in the same family. But, you know, um, and, and, then, and then it got really exciting to go, oh my God, we're nominated for an Emmy. And then, and, 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 Obviously, the, well, not obviously, but the reason it was really exciting is because uh, I've been in shows that have been nominated for stuff and I've been in, you know, uh, uh, and that have won stuff, but always kind of day player or, or slightly bigger, you know, but you don't really feel you've got skin in the game. Sure. Um, it's like, it's nice. And your friends who are lovely go, oh, well, well done. And you're a bit like, yeah but you don't really know what i really did sure. yeah and 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 yes you have to take on board that you are a part even if it is a small part of something that was really good but it still doesn't yeah you don't feel ownership sure um and and in this one i there's more ownership which is what was really mind-blowing and very 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 cool what was that like to process then given that obviously 
you know, you had, as you say, more skin in the game. Did you feel that that was an easy thing to accept? Or do you have any kind of resistance around that? Because to your point, it's the first time maybe you've had that. So I'm curious about how that manifested for you. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of um, in and out of, you know, who do you think you are feeling any kind of ownership? But actually, but that's a lot fuck it's so much better than it used to be sure um and i think quite a quick step back into no i do have ownership in this um it's a recurring role it's in you know multiple episodes and i you know the the character has an arc i'm not i'm not just delivering information you're not you're not <laughs> madame exposition Señora Exposición. Señora Exposición. Ahora, ¿qué tal? Today, I want to tell you... Everything. That the building over there is owned by the bad guy. <laughs> And scene. Hey, man. Listen. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Listen, that's still skin in the game. Some exposition is important. Yeah, but you know, you know what I mean. Sure. Um, sure. And... Uh, It was more. It was. It was more. I think not really knowing what uh, it was, and and but also it. What was interesting is clocking that I didn't want to know what it was because if I looked into it and found out it was actually really big, that would completely freak me out. Right. Uh, and so I slightly. I held myself in willful ignorance. And it literally wasn't to, oh, the cat has cat food. I don't know if you can hear little tinkle, I can. tinkle. I can. The cat has, is very happy right now. I mean, um, if it sounded like you were depriving the cat of food for like the last week. So yeah, it was I'm actually glad. since early this morning, but that's the same thing same, in the same. cat's mind. Exactly. Um, uh, and it was, but it wasn't till uh, I got to New York and that, and the night I arrived, we all met up. Uh, all the group who were there, um, just in a sort of restaurant bar down the road. And the director said, he was like, no, this is really big. He said they have about a thousand entries oh, wow. and four nominations from all around the globe. And I was like, okay, that's actually... A thousand's a fucking shitload, like... That's, yeah, like I would have maybe thought a few hundred for sure. Apparently. And that's a lot, but. Uh, yeah. But I mean, but of course then, I mean, it's kind of like, well, why wouldn't you, you know, if you've made a, a show you believe in? I mean, sod yeah. it. Enter yeah. it, enter it in. If it's, you know, not got any US links, why not? Um, so I think for, so for, the, for, for all the rest of us, it felt very out of left field that we were actually nominated because we didn't even know that that it had been entered in any way um and i guess there's also that thing of like any project you do it and you do the work and then by the time it comes out and then anything like this happens it could be a year nine months two years so but also i mean it's 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 to not only is it totally out of your hands but i mean it's it's part of the same kind of i you know i think the healthy thought process of the audition it's like It's, it's none of my business what anyone thinks of my work. All I can do is I do me and be as fully expressed as I can and have the best time I can while I'm doing it. And, and that's kind of it because I have, I, although, yeah, we're talking about skin in the game, but I fundamentally have no ownership over what I've done once I've done it. Yeah, you're not producing, you've not got any- I'm not projects. editing. Yeah, you're not the I'm director. Not, I'm not, I'm not, crafting the 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 the, the ultimate performance um and so yeah you're like so that's a super interesting point because i'm curious now to understand for you with that acknowledgement of that when that came into sort of conscious awareness for you as a performer were you always aware of that from a young age or when you started in your late 20s or has that been a process Oh, no, that's been a complete process. Uh, funnily enough, I was coaching someone a couple of days ago and we were talking exactly about this because he's done a lot of theatre. Mm -hmm. And so we're just, um, at the moment, just talking a lot about what it means working with a camera rather than in the theatre. And 
And it was really interesting to clock that a lot of things that I now kind of take as information that I just, I take it for granted. Mm -hmm. and, and it reflected back to me, reminding me of when I didn't know it, which is, uh, and I, don't, I can't, I wish I could remember who said this to me first, but that theatre is the actor's medium. We are in complete control for good or bad or evil or benefit of the world as to what happens on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's purely in our hands. That, and also there's the aspect of because we are performing to an audience which can be some distance away that we consciously or unconsciously use our bodies to help us uh, tell the story and our voices in ways to tell the story to heighten it for people who are at some distance away and how the idea that there's a fundamental difference between that and film is that it's often taken as you have to make it smaller you're doing too much and what I was saying to him is I said it's the thing is I, I think you can reframe that which is when you're on a stage, particularly when we're starting out, a lot of us are on bare stages. And so we really are the storyteller. We're the whole fucking thing. But when you're uh, on screen, you are purely one part of the storytelling. And actually you can take off probably 60 to 70% of the responsibility for storytelling. Mm -hmm so much more than you think and that's kind of where I think the doing less gets confused mm. because what we don't know is so number one the first thing when I was told that act that, that theatre is a an actor's medium and film is a director's and editor's medium that was the first kind of light bulb because I have no control over what my performance looks like zero um, and really understanding that, that, you know, if we've done four takes and they are reasonably different, the one that's chosen leading on to the next scene can completely shape, di shape, shape uh, 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 an, the arc of a scene differently. One can be more comedic, one can be more serious, one can be more dramatic. Um, hold on one second. What can't you find? Food for the girls. Oh, they're in plastic bags by the front door? Sorry, darling. Thank you for getting the cat food. It's my mother-in-law. You called it. You did call it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm leaving that in too, by the way. So yeah, to okay. So the context, we, yeah. call, that, we knew that had happened. Yeah, that's my, that, that was Francoise, everyone. She's lovely. Um, where the... Fuck was I? You were uh, talking about the difference between uh, obviously coming so yes. on stage, directors and editors being the so, ones that have ownership of the story. And and really, and and I don't think I I didn't understand that. It took time for that to really sink in. It took time for working on things mm -hmm. and leaving set with with a feeling of what my performance had been, and then seeing it and going. Ah, sometimes going, that was the shit take. Why did they use that take? Thinking it's all about you yeah. and going, no, they may have chosen it because you had boom shadow or, or this. I mean, I've done a short, I did a short film. I felt so bad for the, um, the writer, director, such a good script. And I think the sound guy was on drugs. The sound was terrible. It looked amazing. Um, it was with Tobias Menzies, who's like an amazing actor. I mean, okay, he was a lot younger then, but it was couldn't use it. He couldn't even use it on my showreel. Oh man! Okay, and yeah. it's just that understanding. It's it. out of there are so many things. There are so many reasons they might use, you know, one take over another, and we have absolutely no influence on that. And that can either be liberating, or debilitating depending on how you frame it but I yeah guess. and let's always go for the empowering frame of course um yeah but that's also a good thing to say and remind because it's like okay well i'm thinking about it this way and it's making me feel shit huh how can i you know 
Well, I was going to say, because that's the kind of thing that people will say or post on an Instagram kind of post and make it sound jazz. But a lot of times you hear it and go, yeah, great. What the fuck does that mean? Or how do I actually do that? And it's a practice of, like you say, reminding yourself oh, yeah. or whatever works for you, because, you know, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. But yes, that conscious choice of picking the empowering choice is always the best way to free you up in whatever you're doing. Yeah. I mean, also just to stop you feeling shit all the time. Sure. Yeah, that helps. Uh, uh, but going back, hang on, there was, there was something. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So the thing about the theater to the screen. So, yeah, number one, you have no control. But number two, you're only, the, yeah, this thing that you're only actually telling. We're used to, you know, I mean, we're such magnificently sort of egocentric beings, as I think we have to be. Uh, actors, you know, you've, you've, well, egocentric is probably the wrong word, but you have to be interested in your, in yourself and in humanity. You have to learn your own instrument. So uh, there is a healthy level of self-interest. What I think is unhelpful often coming from theatre, particularly if we've been making our own work or is, is that we feel it's all on us and it's this, and it's reminding ourselves that uh, that everyone who has anything to do with what is on screen is telling part of the story. So the set behind you is already telling part of the story to the audience. They immediately go, oh, you're in a hospital. There's something going on here with the story. Uh, if you're wearing a right coat, they immediately go, oh, you're a doctor in the hospital. So you don't have to do anything doctorly. Uh, the makeup you've got on, you might then have a black eye. Oh, you're a doctor in a hospital who's been attacked by a patient or who's just been attacked by their partner or fell off their bike. But the audience is already pulling so many threads of story before you've even opened your mouth. Um, and yes, that's true to a degree in the theater, but we don't see as clearly in the theater as we do on a screen. We can't pick up so many details sure. in such a short amount of time. And we forget that as actors. And so really clocking that and seeing and understanding that all we have to do is the basis of what we're doing on stage anyway, which is show up, listen, react, and say the fucking lines. Um, which of course sounds really simple, but with an open heart, which is the really difficult aspect in our vulnerability. Um, but it's just understanding, actually there's way less to do than you think on a set. Well, because so much, like you say, is kind of taken care of, not for you, but for the purpose of the story. On behalf of, to serve the story. Yeah. Um, which is why what they always say is true, which is the script is always the first port of call for the story to be key. And then everything kind of branches out from there. But ultimately, be, I mean, the director yeah. crafts the vision, but still without... And that's other... not even, not even counting in then when they, you know, adjust the, the color of the, of the whole thing, which is going to give you a mood and the music and the... We just, we are not responsible for all the storytelling. Which we like a... to think we are, but we're just not. <laughs> yeah. Do you think some of that could come from also, you know, the culture that we seem to be in where there is this idea of, you know, false gods and false worship of celebrity. And you see the movie stars for better or worse. And because you hear them oftentimes talking about they carry the movie, they carry the, the project and you need the name that does that, that as actors or even people who are in the industry, you look at that as the, as the reference point and you go, well, that's what it must be for every single actor, kind of distinguishing actors and, and movie stars in, in the mix. What are Interesting. Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm sure for some people, yeah, that is going to play into it. Yeah. You're ca yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're carrying the movie. So it's so interesting because I suppose, yeah, I, that's not my link to it anymore. For me, it's just like, they will bring in the box office. Sure. 
you know, they'll bring in the, the moolah. It's not because they're doing, they're muscling their way through the movie unless you're talking about some Certain place. people, maybe some do, sure. But I think that's the good framing though, right? Like it is the money side, but I just think the yeah. conversation maybe doesn't happen where you can compartmentalize those things separately from business and craft. Which is yeah, fun. it just makes me think of if I can do an epic clang and drop a name on the floor. Uh, don't be doing that. Donk. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I was asked to help with a table read for a certain very, very successful movie star. Mm -hmm. And there were, I mean, I was sitting at the table just going, looking at the other people who were there for this table read and like just the guy who was reading the stage directions and I was like, And so all the rest of us were sort of English actors. And then there's this American movie star. And we just, so these, I think, fairly successful writers wanted him to have a, just to hear this new script they were presenting to him. And so we all read it. And <laughs> to one degree or another, all of us English ones, fucking giving it our all, telling story. And he's just like, Oh, and we're all a bit like, oh, blah, 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 blah. and it's like, oh, okay. We're giving no fucks on this read through, okay? But I mean, like, as in we're giving no, it's just a bit unfair. He was really good, but it was just, but he allowed, he was just himself. Go figure. I know, right? And I think at that stage, uh, which was, before I got into regular acting class or anything, I was fucking giving it welly, mate. I was like, fucking ever, this is my fucking acting. This Here is, you go. It's, it's all on the table. It's all coming out now. Um, yeah, it's clearly very impressive. But the interesting thing was, I wasn't the only one. Sure. And there was a extremely amazing actor on my right hand side who I'd seen in Shakespeare when I was 16 playing Prospero. And I'm sitting there going, my knee's touching his knee. And he was giving it, every, giving it all that as well. Uh, so a pair of us clearly a bit like, oh, look, we can act. It's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Like the way that your mind works when you get in those kinds of situations. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. This is why I was so excited to bring you on and talk to you in this kind of format, right? Because I think there's lots of stuff out there where you can hear people talking to celebrities or known actors and you hear about their stories and their journeys. And that's super interesting, but sometimes it's not maybe as relatable because we're not maybe in those positions yet. And I think you're the consummate, in my mind, working actor who probably is one role away from being like big time, let's be real. But for people, all right, let's calm down though. But for people listening, for people listening in who I know are like maybe starting out early in their acting career or have a few credits or aren't quite working consistently, I think it's more useful to hear the thoughts of someone like yourself who is mm. regularly, who's, you know, got insights that aren't that far away removed from where some of my audience maybe are at because it's, it's more relatable to go, yeah, like, what would I do in that situation in a table read when I'm with a movie star and an actor that I admired when I was 16, you know, in, in Shakespeare? And so, you know, I, I think it's it's fascinating, but also great because you're sharing, I think, what most people as humans would probably do anyway. I, I swear, I nearly shit myself. I was just like... Maybe aside from that part, that's probably just, <laughs> that's probably just you. No, I think most people would. Fair enough. I, I mean, it's just like, yeah, I'm just like remembering, oh God, it's just, it was so surreal. Um, and when you started, because you were saying this is when you're starting in your career, but you didn't start sort of super, super like young in your teens, did you? You were, if I'm wrong, you were like, you tried other shit first before you decided to properly go. Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I didn't, I honestly didn't understand or know that that acting could be could actually be uh my job yeah um i i'd just taken on board uh i think from school culture family culture general culture that 
uh, it was like a fun thing to do. It was like a hobby. Mm. Um, didn't have, how well, certainly in uh, Alive, I didn't have any uh, actors in my family. Or, well, having some, on my dad's side, there are quite a few step, step, step bits. And it turns out I do have cousins who are actors, but I didn't know that. I mean, we didn't know them growing up. Um, and it also turns out on my dad's side going back, that there are actors. Okay. Uh, but again, I didn't find that until I was actually at drama school. And I was like, mom, why has nobody ever talked about this? She was like, oh, haven't they, darling? I'm like, I think I might remember. Um, but so it just wasn't, and, and, and interestingly, definitely in my, so my mom uh, was like in rep, and was like the front end of the pantomime cow (laughs) and was like in rep for one season. Um, So she'd liked it and my grandmother had loved it, but there's no way her father would let her Mm. because, you know, can't have my daughter being a whore. Um, I don't think it was put quite as brutally as that, but effectively. Yeah, even even though his daughter, my mother, married a guy whose grandmother was an actress. So uh, in the 19th century, and her dad was an actor manager. Um, but they probably didn't know that about them, otherwise they would have said no. Yeah. But there's lineage there, though, then there is. Yeah, know, there's a little bit. There is, a, there is a little bit. And but but anyway, so that was a real off to the side. But um it's, I, I did every other job that I thought I ought to do or that I thought I would be good at. I did everything that my brain, the mm. intellect was saying, this might suit, that might be good. You can make a and living, that's safe. Yeah, 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 all the practical stuff. I did a degree in business studies um, and Italian. So um, yeah, been there without the Italian. But oh my God, yeah. economics. Yep. statistics yep have you I mean, have you have you ever used it well on what pla- it's so interesting because again the sort of part of the the for me the actor's journey again is getting to know yourself you you have to get to know your instrument which is yourself but the 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 glorious uh, lack of self-knowledge of my self in my 20s and uh, all these ideas I had about what would be a really, you know, I because, you know, it was, it was sort of 80s into 90s, uh, what do we worship is money, so I'm going to get a business degree, I'm going to work in the city, I'm going to make fuck loads of money um, and be really successful, and then I'm going to retire and I'm going to have loads of money, do whatever I want. Yay, that's 80s values for you. Um, At what cost as well, which nobody really spoke about, right? Like... And how many pounds of flesh do you need to give for that, uh, for that little sack of coin? Sure. Yeah. Well, all, all that stuff. And interestingly, one of the jobs I started with when I was 19, I got a job in a bank in France. Uh, and it was an Arabic bank. And um, I was working in the proper, like not the highfalutin banking, the proper banking side. Um, and it was mind-numbing work. Uh, it was manually inputting checks into a computer at the end of each day, all the checks that had come in to be cashed. The only occasional interest was when very wealthy members of the royal family came in and seeing how many thousands and thousands of pounds they'd spent at which shoe shop. <laughs> and you'd just be like, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, but that kind of got old quite fast. Uh, But downstairs was the dealing room um, where all the the fancy people were who had the designer clothes and, you know, that's what we all wanted. And it was so interesting because I did have some, thank God, some instinct because I was initially like, that's where I want to be. But nobody ever, nobody, and I was, you know, there I was with this sort of thrusting, ambitious young woman going, you know, but but it's like in order to get a, um, what do I mean, a promotion in this bank you someone dies or leaves because it's like one branch of this bank and it's like there's no there's nowhere to go and 
And initially it was because I want to be in the dealing room. I want to be one of those people. Mm. And I remember this woman, and she was always so chic. And I think she maybe was Lebanese. She was really attractive, really nice. But And then gradually, over this first three-month trial period, I realized all they were doing was sitting in an underground room, watching screens with numbers go down them. All day. And something in me suddenly went, oh shit, that is actually my idea of hell. Ha. Huh. And so that was good because something, mm. and then, but that then sent me back to the UK to do university. Um, so I tried banking and then I got in, but with it, I, I still had, it was sort of months ahead. So I, what else did I, I worked in, I'd already, I tried, I'd already tried publishing uh, uh, I worked in sort of like an interior design thing. Uh, I waited tables. Um, uh, I did, oh God, I can't even remember. I did credit control for something. I did, uh, I actually ended up in another bank. I, I did a lot of temping. Uh, I worked for an oil company. And again, hubris. I love this to me, it's the hubris of the actor. Um, I was, <laughs> ah, I was temping, I was temping in an oil company and on this desk where they, um, uh, they kind of charted where it was really interesting where all the oil tankers were yeah. uh, around the globe. And it's like, so we've got this oil tanker that's moving there and that's full and then that one's empty and da, 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 da. But it was a really long winded way of working all that shit out. And I was like, I'm sure I can come up with a sort of a, a, what was I working on? Hang on, was it Word and what's the program that... Excel? Excel. I can come up with an Excel thing that's going to track this. And the guy was like, can you? Yeah, go for it. Me with my computing degree. And now you've revolutionized the oil industry henceforth. And I started doing it. And I was like, yeah, because that will just get that. And then, and then, and then my other half, who does have a computing thing, when he says, really? And I brought all this stuff home and I was working on it. And he was like, and he was like oh, that's really interesting. And he was like, he's like, I couldn't do that. He's like, you're not. And I was like, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And then I eventually just kind of very quietly just stopped reporting in about it and was just like, yeah. I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. But I love that. I mean, I genuinely thought, yeah, it's a piece of piss. They're yeah. just, you know. I can ride a horse. I can do whatever. It's, yeah, it's, it's that. I can design thing. a program to track a very large oil company's oil tankers all around the globe. I mean, I really hope they didn't use it because there might be litigation about the oil spills that have been I happening. I don't think in it ever. Past. Thank God. <laughs> But you're doing all this. At what point do you go, fuck all that shit, acting? Like, was it a, I've hit the bottom of all the kind of things I could try and there's nothing left? Or was it? A combination, that? combination. Uh, I tried lots of things and um, had kind of, yeah, it's like there was always something mm -hmm. wrong with them or that I didn't like. Or it that didn't was just feel not... right. But you can't put your finger on exactly. All yeah, that. I mean, it was like, yeah, with, with, with working in publishing, I was this d disappointment that everyone wasn't loving each book and treasuring it as a beautiful, precious thing. And it was a factory line. And I was like, you can't treat books that way. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, and there was always something like that. Uh, so it was a combination of, but, but that wouldn't have tipped me over. Uh, it was going to university when I was 23. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, completely overexcited in Freshers Week and I joined, oh God, I think it was nearly 20 different societies. Right. Um, you know, from fantasy role playing to, uh, uh, um, you know, the paragliding, to you know horse riding to and that's my dog uh to the own the doorbell's just rung 
Welcome I... to my home. I'm just going to see if anybody's answering it. The dog. Un, un segundo, por favor. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. We're whispering outside. And we're back. I paused I... and resumed. I oh, paused cool. and resumed. Good thinking. So, yeah. It's just me, dead space. It's, yeah. it's boring after a while. Yeah. Yeah. But oh. you're so cute. Um, I mean, it's a long while, but still after yeah. a while, I guess, boring. <laughs> so... Uh, then I got to university, and yeah, yeah, and the only society that I stuck with was drama. Okay. And started to have a ball, mm. and then more of a ball, and more of a ball, and more of a ball, and more of a ball. But this and was then... still hobby. I'm enjoying it. Still not in the phase of this could be a career thing. Yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't till I left, and um, this sort of, and then I was like, you know, all right, let's get back onto my track of my. I now have a business degree. I'm trilingual. Um, and the idea had been I was going to go because I was living in Paris I was going to go back to Paris and work in the Bourse which is like the city oh, oh my god <laughs> 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 to any people from the city that are watching in on this which is highly unlikely uh, I agree you're all douchebags no um, no no but no it's just these but these ideas this all this bonfire the vanities you know I've, I had the most epic shoulder pads ever on my suit. Oh, did you? You had the oh 80s style. God. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Power, power going to my head. I think that's probably what it, I think it was the costume, actually. I think that's what sold me on it was, was like, I was the heels, the jewelry, the pad. That, that's why I wanted to work was the clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I finished university and this sort of this there was this little idea that wouldn't go away which was why am i planning on spending as, well if not the rest of my life the next few years doing a job in which i have no interest i can do it mm. i know i would be able to do it but i have no passion, interest, joy associated with it. And the one thing that I have done over the last four years of my degree, there is one thing that has brought me, made me feel alive, that has, I have a passion for, that, that brings me so much. It just, I'm fucking you. sparkling in my skin. You're you. You're your. Yeah. Yeah. And I can expand into more of myself than any environment I have ever found myself in. What the fuck am I doing? And then I'd swing around to. But it's not a proper job. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I may never earn any money. How, how am I going I to live? X, Y, and Z. How will I live? How, how would anyone ever be interested <sighs> in me? Uh, but, but, but you know what? Those were all spirals around. Mm. And as it got tighter and tighter, it was, what if I'm no good? Sure. <sighs> sure. What if the thing that I love... Doesn't love me back? Oh. Life 101, because we ain't just talking acting now, right? Oh, so, I mean, that, that was what was terrifying. But that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that didn't go away at that stage when you did take the jump, because that's something all humans, especially actors, being self-aware beings, like you say, or at least needing to be self-aware beings, you have to face up to that and, and sort of really go into that chasm and, and deal with all of those things to then try and understand where does the real love come from and, and then give yourself that freedom to express outwardly all of the clunky stuff, whether it's the lack mm. of love for yourself or when you do finally love yourself, what that looks like, um, that doesn't happen overnight. So you still took the plunge. Was it the fear of not going down that road was 
bigger than the fear of like just sticking with the the simple fundamentally yeah because i had my grandmother the one whose father wouldn't let her do it i had heard her say on more than one occasion i could have been on the stage resentment's the fucking killer isn't it it's and like, i was like yeah. i am not i am not going to say that to my children mm. I am not going to tell them a story of I could have but didn't. Was that because really I don't want yeah. That because really, I don't did you have I don't at that stage? No. No. But it's That's like or, or it's that even that or it's the device. Or it's even I, I don't know if it was about I I think the idea was I don't want to be telling that to future generations. My future generations whether it was mine or it was nieces or nephews. I don't want this to be my story. That's so interesting, though, because you're still at that age. What were you, 25, 26? No, I was 20, 20, well, 28. Yeah. Okay. But you're in your 20s still. Yeah. Like to be coming from a perspective of it wasn't implicitly just about you. It was yeah. about, it was, but it was about. Well, also... it was, it, no, but it was because it's like, I don't want that to be my story. Because I also had a mother who had, you know, fucking amazing woman, but. You know, she'd had six kids. She didn't have her own life. life. Okay. And sure. her mother didn't have her own life. Mm -hmm. And I'm the youngest of six. And I saw that repeating. And you already know what your life's going to be before it even happens if you well i had i mean i had a massive wake up um fuck i remember at 19 i mean the you know the power of essentially that you know we're born in a patriarchal system we're born in we're born at the time we're born with the beliefs going around us mm -hmm. and the kind of school that i went to i mean fuck not only Okay, not only was acting never considered, even though I acted at school and was considered pretty good, but that was like, that's nice. I mean, this was the school where I found out uh, about five years after we left, we went to a lunch with a, with a lot of other um, the people I was there with, and maybe it was 10 years, and one of them, who's gone on to be fucking brilliant, but wasn't amazing at school, uh, she went to the careers office and said to them, yeah, I think I, I kind of, I'd like to, you know, look into medicine and being a doctor. And they said to her, don't you mean a nurse? Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh dear. I mean, when I heard that, I was like, what the actual fuck? But that's the, that's kind of the feeling of the environment is a fun, essentially you're going to get married and be looked after by your husband, you might work. Yeah, you have your box, they have you're gonna box. have Yeah, your box, and that's the way it's going to go. And it wasn't till I was 19, living in Paris, and I was living with fucking the most amazing people from all around. There was this wonderful kind of international community. But some of the girls coming in were from Oxford, and they were super bright. And they, they did not have this fucking mm. worldview. And I remember sitting one night talking with some of them and just suddenly having this fucking light bulb go on that I can do anything okay, within reason of my intellect or where my financial ability to get to get something. But if I set my mind to something. And that was like a white fucking light going off in my head, just going because I'd never that, that that the idea that you could create your own worldview as opposed to just accepting what's given yeah. you as the one and yeah. only, which even to and yeah, I'd already been living I'd already been living abroad, so I knew you know, but but sure. the, the, as as it actually pertained to me in my life that I could make my own choices, and it still took me another practically fucking ten years to decide that acting was what I wanted to do. But, you know, hey, 
I've I spent enough time beating myself up about that. I don't do that anymore because I'm like, you know what? It took the time it needed to take. Sure. But. And I mean, you can like, always yeah. unwire a very sort of ingrained no. worldview that quickly because also some of these things don't just exist within you and your 19, 20 years. It's, as you said, generations and generations. Yeah, prior. I mean, I'm, I'm the first, I am the first female in my family line to get a degree. Which is awesome. Even my if, uncles went to university. Sure. It's even more awesome that you got the degree and then we're like, cool, thanks. Peace out. See you later. I'm going to do, but yeah, because it's just a piece of paper at the end of the day, but you kind of sort of, you know, played your game, played my game. Yeah. You know, it's like, I had to play it through. I had to play that through. And yeah. Um, so something that, and I also, you know, and I'm also saying this, noting, you know, I come, I come from a background, you know, I come, I started off with a fuck of a lot of privilege from the point of view of being able to go into acting uh, you know, I had, I knew I had support behind me. I wasn't going into it thinking you mean financially. Yeah, financially. And I'm really aware of that. Um, I ultimately, I did have the support of my family. I, and, and their support could be made financially. Uh, and that's certainly, you know, I mean, having said that I did go, I went to the poor school. So, the whole point of it was that you could work and I did work the whole way through. So I, you know, nobody else was paying for my tuition. And that was also why I didn't even try to go to a bigger drama school because I was like, I mean, I was lucky because I went to uni when the fees were being paid. So I didn't have to repay any of that shit. I did have to repay a loan at the end of it, but, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, that, that I came into it at, at, at a time when it was a it was a lot easier um and you know actors ask me about you know what's the thing that you would really recommend and i have to say now i do recommend being in a regular class but i also appreciate it's a it's a fucking outgoing sure. but then of course on the other side of that is that we're running our own businesses and if you were running a flower business or a food business you would have to buy in in the flowers every week and the problem for us is it's not a linear career path. So we're buying in the flowers, but we're not selling any for what feels like fucking months. Well, and that's the difference. I think that's the one caveat when there are so many parallels between entrepreneurship and what we do as actors. But that point of if I'm selling a product or a service as part of a business, I can go to market and it's a bit more linear with the transaction. This isn't yeah. quite as, this isn't a transactional business that we're no. in. It's, it's relationships really at the core of it. And then right place, right time. And so many other right parts. energy. I mean, yeah. And so it's so much more ethereal. So you can't point your finger and say, if I, you know, if, if with my business, if I make this website with this funnel and this email thing, then maybe I'll get at least some sales to pay the rent. Yeah. But with what we do, well, if I take three workshops and maybe schmooze with this person and maybe you get lucky. And, you know, if I get that one audition that I book it, then I can maybe pay half my rent, depending on where I live in the world. Yeah. That's kind of the dichotomy. So then you have to juggle like yep. many of you, that with some way of bringing in money. Yeah. Whilst this kind of is elevated by this, which is OK. And it used to be maybe not OK to have a different job. But I yep. think if you're going to be a regular class, like you said, you've got to pay for that shit. You've got to pay for that shit. So it's an investment in your career that might not pay off until much, much later. And the interesting thing is that even with me knowing that, and I mean, when I started going to regular class, I already had, you know, a fair amount of stuff on my CV. So I was already in relatively pretty good position. And even then, I mean, there were definitely times where I was just like, I just can't afford to do it. And the really interesting thing was it was my other half who runs his own business Mm. who on a couple of occasions just turned to me and went, but you have to. It's what it takes. Like, isn't that a bedrock? Yeah. And I, and, and, and I was the one going, oh no, we can't because we, I don't know, got to buy X, Y, and Z for the kids, or we've got to pay this or that. 
And it was really interesting to me that at certain points, well, I suppose at the time I phrased it as he's taking my career more seriously than I am. But I don't know, I mean, that may have been part of it, but I think it's also that he possibly running his own business is like, you have to pay the rent. Mm. And it's kind of like, you know, going to class is paying the rent for our premises. This is our premises. This is... And if we don't have premises that are fit for purpose, we can't run our business. Or we can, but in a really reduced way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really work. Um, I mean, certainly that was my experience. Mm -hmm. The longer that I wasn't working, uh, the more re sort of reductive my choices, my, 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 my willingness to be open, my willingness to be vulnerable in an, in an audition situation got narrower and narrower and narrower. The auditions that were coming my way, the variety in them got narrower and narrower and narrower. And it was all lawyers and doctors, people who didn't show their emotion. Well, there's a fucking surprise. Uh, and really, I mean, uninteresting. And I didn't know what was going on. I just knew there was a problem. Mm. I knew, I was like, I don't know what the fuck, something is not working. And I think that was when I took my first class. It wasn't a regular class then, it was like a master class. But that was definitely the beginning of a gradual reopening back to and beyond where I'd been when I left drama school. Because mm. of course, there you're doing it every fucking day. Sure. And the responsibilities of the world are there, but not maybe quite as much as when yeah. you then leave it. And, and then you, know, you have a life family happens. and yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Absolutely. But, but, so, but before you had a family, you'd already worked and done stuff. So you yeah. kind of built to a point. Yeah. And I know you mentioned obviously about, you know, your family and how they had all these kids and how your mom had like, kids and that was her life. And that's not something you wanted to maybe have a life that wasn't yours, I guess, was the words. Yeah. When it came to having your own family, was there a part of you that was like, but what about my career? How did oh, yeah. that work? Because this for me is interesting from the point of view of, I know a lot of people that talk about this from their point of view saying they know friends or through the grapevine, they don't know if they're going to have kids or if they should, but they want to, but they don't know how to, you know, have a family and a career as an actress can you do it? And, you know, I always kind of say, well, I've got a friend who she's done it pretty damn well. And she did kind of have a break there in between. So it's definitely more than doable. But I know it the, might no, not have been easy. I, I mean, OK, so I had uh, uh, on my I then had someone else I knew who was actually a producer. And. What she always said. Was there is no right time, just fucking have them. Right. And I was like, yeah, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, oh, that's easy for you to say because you're really fucking successful. Um, but she would just reiterate, there is no right time. Uh, and so when I, and I do, when I go down the lane of, oh, God, if only, you know, if I'd started when I was in my teens... I'd be so much further ahead than where I am now because obviously I still think it's linear even though I know it's not. Sure. I'd have won six Emmys by now at least, not just... <laughs> I know, right? Um, more that I would have got to a point before I decided to have kids and, and so it wouldn't... Uh, I mean, I've got all these fantastic stories. Sure. Um, but, you know, the thing is I did, you know, I did my first job when I was 30. So already, um, you know, from a biological, biological perspective, uh, the clock was ticking. Um, yeah. Thank you, doctors, gynecologist fucking fuckers. Yeah. Uh, geriatric mother over here and <laughs> really resenting that term. Um, but my other half was like, when are we going to have kids? It's like, you're starting this new career. And I was like, la, 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 
la 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 don't want to have this conversation don't want to hear it i'm all excited fuck off yeah uh but of course eventually i had to have the conversation and i was like i i want five years um and it which is essentially what what happened um and there is a really big argument for having kids younger as a woman, which is you recover so much more quickly. Oh my God. Uh, I hadn't taken that on board at all, but I was totally psychologically not ready or prepared or anything to be a mother in my Mm twenties. It would have been a really bad thing. I think, um, I'm not saying I'm brilliant. I was brilliant having them in my thirties, but I think I was a fuck of a lot more knowing who I am and stuff. But, uh, there is definitely an argument for doing it much younger because your body bounces back. Sure. Um, you can just deal with it. You can juggle more shit. So if you're, you know, if you are uh, of sound mind and body and know much better who you are than I certainly did at that age and people are hesitating and you're with someone and you're in a, you know, you, you, you committed and you see your way forward. Uh, I mean, I've got a, I've got a, a a friend who's fucking brilliant. I mean, she had a kid really young, and she's now kind of really on the up with the number of things she's doing. Um, just the thing is, there's no right or wrong way. You just, if you feel that's what you want to do, you fucking do it, and you accept every offer of help, and you reach out and you make sure I mean this is something you should do anyway not because you want to have a kid it's you need your artistic tribe around you those people who lift you up who support you in your creative endeavors who who cheer you on who are in your front row who all that kind of shit who who are there for you and who will support you when you are doing that when you have a child and if they don't have children no they're not going to get it fundamentally but if they are supporting you maybe some can come in at one point or others and you hook up with a network of other creatives with children because creative people also have children (laughs) lots of them not lots of children but lots of people do and it feels impossible i thought my agent was going to drop me And that's kind of something that I think I wanted to touch on because I think a lot of people have that fear. I totally thought my agent was going to drop me. Mm. And I was terrified of telling them. And I had this really good agent and I hadn't been booking. I would have been, it it was kind of, it was starting to go on the up. Actually, that's, uh, but when I started, I started really strong with a really good thing. And then it didn't come out for about two years because there was a lot of post on it. And I started to get really, as I'd said before, started to get really scared and, and, and much less, not taking risks, but just, you know, being willing to show yourself. Because mm. it's scary doing that in front of strangers. Another reason to get in class, because you build up your tolerance for going, hey, this is me. Without going, hey, no, I don't actually want to show you what, because that feels really awkward and embarrassing and shameful or whatever. Um, oh, I've totally lost the thread now. Bring me back, Ash. Kids, 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 all about having kids. Kids, 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 agent, agent, agent. Your agent was going to drop you in your mind. My agent, so I phoned, so I phoned, and, 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 and I was like, um, I've got something to tell you, um, I'm pregnant. And the only response I got, well, I got was like, oh, for fuck's sake. And I was like, it's like oh. what is going on? All our actresses are pregnant at the moment. And that was it. And then it was, so what I took from that was, other actresses get pregnant too. <laughs> it's a thing. And, and of course, the, the dot, dot, dot that comes after that is that if your agent does have an issue with it, then they're a fuckwad and they shouldn't be your agent. Because you do not want people like that working for your small business. And you learn and you'll find out whether they're supposed to be in your corner or not. Yeah, because if, if, like if, that. that's if that's what comes out, they are not in your fucking corner. They're in their own corner and they can fuck off there and stay there and drown in their own shit. Yep. Yeah. Or, you know, 
at least just be quiet in a corner by themselves and leave people alone. Okay. But if people have to drown, all right, we'll let them drown. But Sorry. no, I think it's I think it's important, like you're saying, though, to have that that group of people in your business and your tribe, creatively and from the business side that that are there for you. And, yeah, you know, and I, I mean, I kind of lost that. I lost that for a while after my after I had kids because I was. Uh, um, I was uh, mixing with, you know, fabulous people, but who were all parents of friends of my kids, you know, doing that. I, and I suddenly realized that was another aspect that I was not feeding myself, which was staying in contact with my artistic tribe, mm. with people, with other people who are creating and understanding that if, you know, that, that's another thing is it's really easy as a parent to sort of shame yourself. Like I'm not doing all the things. I should be writing, I should be coming up with my own work, I should be directing, da, 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 da. and it's to just go easy on yourself, is allow that self-compassion going, you know what I'm producing? I'm producing another human being, and that's a long-term project, and that actually takes up a huge amount of energy, and that's okay, and it's actually not only okay, it's valuable, and it's important, because I have so many times uh, just been like, I should be writing you know, I'm talking to friends and they're like you know they've written a script or they've got and I'm like oh my god I've just I've got all these ideas and I've dotted them down in certain places and I should have picked up that one and I should have written that and it's like no I've got enough on my fucking plate right now everybody's on a different journey you know and everyone's a- on that's it is like that and it that goes and then I'm and of course I'm just I'm going straight into the compare thing Right, the comparison sure. thing. So I'm going, oh, they're doing that. I should be doing that. It's like, no, I am not the same artist as they are. Mm. None of us are the same artist as each other. The only value we have is in our authenticity. And so live in that, loose, you know. Have your experience and yeah. then document and talk about and live. Oh God, I don't want to hear this. You know what? I really, I like inside. I'm just going, I don't want to hear it, but it's, but it's true. But it's kind of, but I resist it. I resist it massively. But we all do because that's what we're ingrained to do. I think for some reason, it's like fight or flight kind of element kicks in because it's scary to go and face up to living your own experience because who the fuck are you to try and create your own life intentionally, you prick? Yeah. And it's also easier to beat yourself up going, but I should be living your experience. Yeah, because doing that is just a way of deflecting from actually taking ownership yeah. of doing it for yourself. So, well, I hate you right now. Oh, that's yeah. It's <sighs> I mean, it is good. It is good, and I don't really hate you, but it's just like, oh, yeah. But these are things, though. This is the experience as humans that I don't care what anyone says. Every fucker has it. Yeah, I think as yeah. a creative, we maybe dive into it head first or get thrown into it head first sometimes yeah. more. Yeah. And so maybe it's more visceral or we, the emotion, maybe we feel it in a different way. I don't know, but. I don't know if it's more visceral, but I think we feel it because, because w- what we do is all about feeling. Sure. So it's just, it's closer. It's closer to our everyday. The emotion, emotion and feeling is closer to our everyday. So, and, and also what I, I mean, this is a complete aside, but um, my, my therapist, uh, he would say that, you know, a healthy processing, a a human healthily processing emotion is that it just comes in and goes out. It's like a a wave, you know, we come and we feed it and out it goes. And he referenced a a mentor of his who, uh, I don't know if he'd lost a close family member and my therapist went to the funeral and he said it was amazing. This guy was just walking around talking to people. He'd be talking to one person. He'd talk to someone else, suddenly being complete floods of tears. Then it would dry up and be off talking. And he just allowed it to flow through him. Mm. And my therapist went, that is the most uh, uh, healthy example of grief, of grieving. And it was extraordinary. And he said, oh, he was like, I can't do that. But of course, that is what we are after. training us we, we are we are doing that's what we're in gym to do is allowing whatever is coming at us to to hit to feel it allow it to go so the next thing can come in i like the mindset conversations and the therapist and all this stuff we're talking about because i don't know if this was a part of your life as intrinsically as it is now <laughs> 
when I first met you, I don't know, seven, eight, eight, nine years ago. So I'm pulling now on a thread here of recent Lucy, you know, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, whatever version we're on. When did this really become a part of your life and a part of your practice for you as you, as the human? And then obviously that sort of overlaps into you as the actor naturally anyway. Uh, so I am not proud of the fact that the very first time I went near anything therapeutic, which was a counsellor, <laughs> When I was at drama school, because uh, a role that I was playing triggered the bejesus out of me okay. uh, because of an earlier family trauma, the only reason I went to the therapist is because I wanted to do a really fucking great job of the role. I thought you were going to say, like, you didn't get the role you wanted, so you went to the therapist. No, I, well, no, but it's a version, I got the role and then was just shouted at by the director for being shit. And the reason I couldn't connect to the role is that it hooked into a family trauma. And so I was like, fuck that. And, and a, a, a friend of mine at drama school sort of took me aside one day and went, uh, Luce, do you think this might have something to do with... Uh, and I just went, oh. no, 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 no. I mean, it just went straight in. And I was like, oh, my God. And then she sort of went, I've been seeing a really counsellor. I really like her. If, if you want the number. And I'm like, yeah, give me the number. The only reason I wanted the number is because I wanted to fucking kill it. Okay. okay. Didn't want to deal with any of that shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not interested. I was like, oh, we've got four weeks until the performance. That should be enough therapy to sort me out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, naive, blessed little heart It's just of mine. the, the, the Band-Aid. That'll patch me up and I'm good to go. Oh, I didn't even think of it as a Band-Aid. It's just like, no, I need her to fix this bit. Sure. Not, yeah, the, the rest is fine. Doesn't need not fixing. Not pull out everything from the inside out. And... Fuck off. But you've been doing a lot of that stuff, though, now of your own volition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that, I did, I did it for a bit and it really annoyingly and weirdly didn't really work uh so i wasn't the you know outstanding anyway i'm sure you were great Stop. yeah whatever um but i then when i had my first kid what where i actually uh, fell into it was i got um i kind of got like a slow postnatal depression it was really weird it was like a really really slow slide into right. just kind of the world being a bit grayer a bit grayer and until i it was about when my eldest was about two and uh actually i was about to say oh my god it's because i got another job no actually it wasn't it wasn't to get sane for a job thankfully i think i'd got over that one uh, i just got to a point where i was just i need help and I did not want to do therapy at all. I had so much shame around it, so much. It was, I felt like a failure. I should be able to fix myself. I mean, all this fucking yeah. just, um, but it just got to a point, I, I, was, I, I wasn't functioning. And a friend, and a friend of mine, another a beautiful acting friend of mine, who clearly seen something was happening, had probably a few months before gone, just, I thought, out of the blue, uh, essentially in the middle of a conversation, it felt like it just said, oh, I'm seeing this really great therapist. Um, if you ever need anyone, I could give you his number. And I was a bit like, no. And then, yeah, just a few months later, I was desperately scrabbling for the phone, phoning her, going, what's the guy's name? What's his number? Um, and that was the beginning of about seven years on and off. Mm -hmm. uh, but with gaps sure. for work and, um, and, and he was brilliant because he, he, he taught, treated, did, did a lot of actors. And so when you didn't have that much cash, you kind of paid what you could. That's cool. That's really good. And then as I, you know, again, as I started to kind of put myself back together, 
uh, weirdly enough, sort of all the other things started to improve too. So mm. I started booking a bit more because I wasn't turning up to auditions kind of going, give me a job. I need this. Love me. Give yeah. Me give me right. love. Give me, take away my shame. All that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I suppose that's another thing is that, you know, there are, <sighs> ask your friends, but I have that network again. I mean, it came, all this came to me through fun. Actually, now I think about it through my artistic tribe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the other people, I mean, who I love dearly, but they're not as ready to understand. It's like, there's something going on. I know someone, or I know someone who knows someone. Um, it's also, I think, like you said at the top when we were talking about the difference between TV and theater or screen and theater, it's that they're both collaborative mediums, obviously, but all the moving parts you get used to coming together as part of a, a sort of microcosm, whether you're doing a play or in a class or on a soundstage. And so there's just this natural thing where whether you, you're friends or it's a stranger that you've just met, all of a sudden you're in the deep end together, rowing in a direction that oh. it requires you to be open to what's happening at that point in time as much as possible. And then being empathetic to what are they doing? What are they doing? How do I fit with that? How can we come together and try and have an energy that just works in the same kind of space? Remove yourself from that and go into sort of the regular everyday world, whatever that fucking means. And I think there can be, if you can keep a degree of that openness available, a little bit more access to having that empathy for other people, whether they're artists or not. So that visibility of what you're going through makes sense that it's going to come from your artistic tribe first because they probably see it sooner because they're that's all well they not only they see it but they're then there's there's a there's less there's less barriers to, there's to courage reaching to talk out about it. well but also because you know the whole th is that you can't have barriers when you act the fear of conflict is i mean maybe it's there but you don't avoid the conflict as much yeah as you have to step in and oh, i mean yeah. all these things i mean all our training uh, leads us to be, oh God, part of me wants to say more empathetic human beings. I mean, there are those people who aren't, of course. But I, I, I do think that my, yeah, I mean, my actor friends are some of the most beautiful, open, empathetic human beings I know. And I mean, like, I, I okay, I mean, so I've been on Zoom class. Uh, I mean, one of the gifts of the pandemic is getting to work with an amazing acting teacher in Toronto. I've been taking Zoom classes with her for a year. Mm -hmm. And I've got to know these Toronto-based actors. I've never met them in the flesh, which kills me. But we, we, have, we have relationships now that are beautiful, these friendships and we fucking celebrate each other's wins and are so excited and mm. and it feels like I, they're just like round the corner and it kills me that they're not. And yeah, everything you said about we create these families. And celebrating the wins. Yeah. That's so big, you know, because again, your journey's yours, my journey's mine, theirs is theirs. And your win takes nothing from me. Well, when you win, I win, other people win. Yeah. Maybe not in the same way visually or how it might look right then and there, but your success paves the way for someone else's success that might be coming behind or alongside or ahead of you. And yeah. you being great on whatever show you just won an Emmy opens doors to then have other people come in on the show or you do something of your own where a part of your tribe comes in and gets involved with that. And it's all always evolving always moving but yeah. it's everyone no man is or no woman or man are left behind necessarily unless they want to be and that's also a choice yeah right but um yeah i think you know i'm with you on tribe i mean yeah i think it goes beyond friendships in some way because the experiences you share within these sort of four walls of a room when you're in a class 
sometimes there are things that you would never fucking do with your groups of friends outside of that or ever talk about because it's a circumstance that we only can maybe get away with experiencing with what we do as as actors which is but it's like it becomes a profound sharing of each other's humanity absolutely which is ultimately what what we do is I mean, that's really what life is if you want to be glib and all kind of philosophical about it, I think, anyway. But isn't it, it's what we're here for. Sure. Connection. Over Zoom with a good internet speed, yeah. ideally. Um, listen, Luz, I like to wrap this up with quick mm-hmm. fire questions from inside the actor studio, which, pray God, you know what that show is. I know what the show is. Yeah, that's the main thing. Most yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people don't. That scares yeah. me. At the end of the show, if you might remember... James Lipton used to ask 10 questions to his guests. So I, uh, yeah, but I can't remember what they are. So no, that's fine. That's what I do. So okay. like all good art, um, I've stolen his questions and I'm going to, I'm going to ask, uh, ask him to you and just whatever comes to mind, uh, whatever comes to mind. Let's red lobster, red, red lobster, purple caviar, James Belushi. Yeah. Uh, the first question is what is your favorite word? I honestly don't have one. I just love words. I okay. fucking take any words. I read like an insane person. So this uh, next question is redundant then because it's what's your oh. least favorite word? Oh, slush puppy. Okay. Fucking slush puppies. Um, okay, what, let me just pick a, a favorite word. Uh, what's your favorite word right now? So there's yeah, question. okay, thank you. What's my favorite word right now? Ugh. Ugh. Resonant. Resonant. It's a good one. Yeah. Are you, are you you're reading some like science mindset books or something and resonancy? Is... No, no. Sci-fi. Oh, interesting. But, yeah. Uh, third question was going to be what uh, turns you on creatively? Ah, people. What turns you off creatively? Ah, Asshole people. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, also people. It's also asshole people. Asshole people. Uh, question number five, what's your favorite swear word? And that can be right now if you kind of mix and match throughout. Oh, what did I come up with the other word? Hairy fuck badges. Wow, that's new. I was going to give you the caveat of in any language, because I know in some languages, some swear words are so much better. No, uh, I, I, I came, I was leaving someone a message the other day and uh, I just came out with hairy fuck badges. Um, that's my current go-to. Nice. Um, what is your favorite sound? Mm, okay, what comes up is the noise There's a little noise a baby makes uh-huh. when it's breastfeeding and it's almost like a little hum okay. to itself. It makes these little animal noises. What's your least favorite sound? Oh, so many. <laughs> What's my least? Actually, what is my? Does, ooh. I don't know. I've got this sort of panoply of things playing in my ears it's right like now. That all of the all of the sounds you hate are coming at you, like a... yeah, that, yeah. Um. Oh God, I've got from I've got from. This is really awful. One of my child, she whistles, but she can't whistle whistling out, so she whistles breathing in, and it's so out of tune. <laughs> And, and she's like, it's fine. And then everyone's going, like, it's fine. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's really out of tune. Uh, to my dog barking right next to me and nearly killing me. Uh, uh, but I don't want to get rid of my dog's bark because I, I feel like if I hate the sound, it's like I'm saying I don't want it to exist. So I've got all kinds of judgments about. Mm. You got to mm. let your dogs and kids express themselves however they want to express oh. themselves, Lucy. Yeah, I mean, whatever. <laughs> says the guy who's got no dog or kids right now, so it's easy, right? I know. I get it. I know how the game goes. Uh, a Donald Trump's voice. Fair enough. I mean, we've had less of that, but yeah, that'd do it. That's, yeah, that's quite a deep one. What job or profession 
other than the ones you've attempted, of which there are many, <laughs> would you would you most like to attempt? Astronaut. SpaceX. Here we go. What uh, what would you never want to do job wise under any circumstance? Dentist. Mm. Podiatrist. Um, I've stolen those from my mother, but um, or, or or what's the one who looks up men's bums? Proctologist. Someone I'm never going to see. <laughs> so, that's all. That's all I know. And by the way, that's the first time that job answers come up on the show. And if it comes up again, whoever says it's getting fucking bonus points. Um, and the, the thing I like about this is the next question is so much more ethereal and grounded because the final question is, when it's all said and done, what would you like the story of your life to be? What legacy do you want to leave behind? Which is a great thing to go to from your last answer about proctology. Um, oh, ask the question again. I've just got, I've got, it's so interesting. My ears I don't want to, I don't want to know what you're seeing. Um, what, when it's all said and done, yeah. What would you like the story of your life to be? <sighs> that. Fuck. That I really, mm, God, it's so interesting. I've got, I've got resistance to saying it because I don't feel that I'm doing it. But what I want to say is that, that I tried, I don't want to try, that I lived as fully. That you have had, claim it as already being done. Oh, oh so much self-judgment. That. I live as fully and full heartedly as I can. Simple, not easy, profound, but that's, that's, that's the work, whatever that means. Right. Yeah. Ah, Lucy, thank you, man. Thank you for coming on. It's been amazing. It's been a roller coaster of a conversation, which I think I always expected it to be. Um, and yeah, I've loved chatting with you. I think people hopefully will get a lot out of this from all the nuggets of wisdom of, you know, what you've gone through in your career and just your journey through going to university and, and motherhood and, and all the judgments and just being so open and candid about those small facets that you were happy to share. So I appreciate you doing that over this medium of Zoom. Um, final moments I always give to the guests, really. So I, you know, would leave the floor to you to sort of let you tell people where they could connect with you if you want them to connect with you on the socials. And final kind of message, like what would be the takeaway message that you'd want to leave people with to round this whole thing off? <laughs> what comes straight into my head is nano, nano, shazbat. Done. Done. <laughs> Mort calling Mindy. Mort calling Mindy. Come on, Mindy. I got the fucking reference. He's out. He's out there somewhere. Robin, I know. Robin's always out there somewhere. Uh... God bless. Hey, well, let's leave it at that. If that's what you're yeah. leaving it with, because I'm good with that. Amazing, <laughs> Lucy. What a fucking show. Thank you for coming on and doing it.